My name's Sharon. Um, I'm a data scientist at Okta. Um, I have the fortune of having the last session um, right before lunch. <laughs> so hopefully we can get through this uh, pretty painless. Um, I guess a quick note before I start. So um, I don't know how many of you here knows um, what Okta does. All right, a couple, great. <laughs> So um, we're a cloud security company. We actually just went public earlier this year. Um, and when I told my manager, I said, OK, I'm going to do a presentation on our um, churn project. She said, OK, go talk to your, our investor relationship. I've never heard of that we had an investor relationship before. They're like, OK, what are you going to talk about? We went down over everything. And they're like, are you going to do a q and I was like, I'm, I was intending on doing a Q&A. And they're like, um, OK, do you know what they're going to ask you? <laughs> I was like, well, if I can you know, predict what they're going to ask me, I wouldn't be doing this. So, <laughs> so I told them, all right, I, I don't know what they're going to ask me, so I guess I'm not doing a Q&A. But if you do have a question, you can catch me during lunch. So um, cool. This is not the presentation I'm doing. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I'm doing another presentation tomorrow, but sorry. Here is the technical difficulty. <laughs> All right, cool. And should probably be more prepared, but um, <laughs> the challenge of predicting churn in the enterprise world. So um, since only a couple of you guys knew what Okta does, so I'll give you a quick overview of what we do. So we are a cloud security, we're a cloud security company. Um, so our motto is that we're the foundation for secure connections between people and technology. That sounds very fancy. I'm sure our CEO sit down with plenty of people that are very good at words and spend you know, tons of hours coming up with all these um, words in the sentence. But um, what we essentially do is that we try to build product and service that allow um, companies' workforce to connect to their application in a more secure way. That means like when you are working at your company, every day you go in, you log into millions, that's probably exaggeration, but dozens of applications, email clients, Slack, um, your Jira, um, and all of those require credentials. So we provide on the most basic level single sign-on service. We also um, provide um, different type of authentication service that allow um, admin to add on more security. So if when you're remote, when you're traveling, um, and then we can detect that you're now in your office, we can add extra layers of security on top of that. Um, and so you know, we want to securely connect anyone and anything. Um, so it's just a quick view um, that our corporate marketing team put together. So we have to put in every single one of our slides. Because <laughs> everyone sells at Okta. Um, so <laughs> we're all part of our sales force. So it's just a quick few products that we provide. But, but really, it's about you know, from end to end. You know, when you go into your office, we want to make sure everything's secure when you're on the road. Um, so. So millions of people actually use Okta every day. Um, you may not have heard of us, but um, we are um, securing some of the largest companies out here. Um, here are just a few examples um, of the companies that we provide our service to. Um, when they log in, you know, when a user comes to the company, they log in, they see a screen like this, um, and they can access all their application without entering you know, 50 passwords that all have different Credential, you know, when you log in, they say, oh, you know, you try your password, they're like, oh, you have to have uppercase, lowercase, and now you have a, have a number, then a symbol, then they're like, oh, it has to be 20 characters long. And you have to change your password every three months. So um, we want to minimize that, so you only have to do it for like one application, which is us. So, um, so here are just our logos which I try really hard to think of a way to transition into the topic of my talk, but I was not having much success <laughs> going from what we, what we do to what I do. Um, so I'll just say, you know, with every large uh, enterprise company, it's very in important to retain um, your customer. We're definitely still a very 
consider a very small enterprise company. So we have our focus on customer success. Um, so customer success, success is very important because you want to make sure when a customer purchase your product, their investment is realized. Um, you know, we have a, a and for, I guess for you who don't know who's, what customer success do, they are um, a team to make sure once a customer purchase product that they are implementing the product correctly, they're using it in, you know, in the most efficient way. Um, so um, we want to make sure that um, their investment is realized. Um, customer su success is also important because it increases the revenue. Um, us, our customer grow, hopefully they're buying more license, they're buying more product, we earn more money. Um, so it's important that um, you know, we make them happy. Um, large company, especially the one with a very flashy logo, also um, influence new sales. Um, when our marketing goes out there, they're like, have you heard of Okta? You know, people are like, no, I don't know what you guys do. And then they'll be like, but did you know that LinkedIn use Okta? And that's how you get them interested. <laughs> first step into new sales. Um, and lastly, um, which is how I intend to segue into my talk, is to reduce turnover. Um, so one of, when a company first starts as a startup, you know, it's all about grow, grow, grow. You want new customers every single day, every single month. You look at the tra trajectory on a graph, like how many customers you have now. But once you get to a certain size, it's very important to focus on retention. And I feel like a lot of companies out there don't think about retention as important as growth. Um, and to reduce uh, turnover, we want to make sure we can predict churn because in order to grow, you want to make sure you're not also losing your customers. So predicting churn. Um, so I'm sure a lot, of there, a lot of you out there are probably much more knowledgeable when it comes to machine learning. Um, and there's a lot of paper out there um, talking about how you can predict churn at a company. Uh, this is my very rudimentary graph. I'm not the best person in PowerPoint. Um, so, so I wanted to demonstrate, you know, a lot of people are out there talking about churn. Um, you know, if you Google it, the first thing that will come up is like, how do you predict churn for email campaigns or consumer subscription? And the thing is, not a lot of people talk about predicting churn in enterprise because it's very difficult. So I'm trying to see where my mouse is. Okay, cool. Um, so this is actually a very simplified comparison in terms of customer growth. This is not by any means how any company, you know, grow. There's a lot more noise in that. Um, but it's, for enterprise and consumer, it's very much like a hockey stick versus steady build. So for a consumer company, you think about someone like Netflix. When they first started, you know, no one have heard of Netflix. Netflix, what is this about, you know, mailing your DVDs and getting it back in the mail? Um, I hope you guys still know what DVDs are. <laughs> um, so, you know, as they grow, there's more and more customer they get, you know, every single month. Eventually, they'll reach an exponential curve. Um, so you see that hockey stick growth. For enterprise, it's not so much. You know, even though probably more people than ever know what we do, um, we're still not, you know, getting, you know, tens of thousands of new customers every single month. We're probably getting, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of new customers every single month. But what makes enterprise uh, so valuable um, is because the way the revenue grows. Us, we go from, you know, most of our customer at first are startup co uh, companies, and then slowly we get, you know, larger companies, then we get, you know, the, the S&P 500 companies. Um, the revenue per customer grow. However, for a consumer, if you're just, cons you know, if you're just subscribing to the same product, I assume Netflix um, monthly subscription fee hasn't really increased in the, the last few years. So, um, so for enterprise, it's important to focus on the lifetime value of the customer. Um, and it depends on recurring revenue. So it's important to retra retain your customers. So just to reiterate, um, focus on retention. Um, it affects profitability, want to maintain growth. And ultimately, churn is very expensive. Um, you know, why is it more expensive to acquire new customer versus retain your current ones. Um, 
for the, the business model of the SaaS industry is that you put all of your investment acquiring new customer upfront. So that includes spending a lot of money on marketing, spending a lot of money on labor. We have um, field engineers flying out to you know anywhere all over the world to make sure that customer understand what we do, why they should choose us over their competitor. However, once they become a customer comes renewal time, you know, you don't have to spend so much. Um, so um, therefore, churn is very expensive. It's one of the, the main focus we've been trying to um, predict for the last few years. So now comes probably what the main focus is, is to build a machine learning model. So here's just a quick, probably not that great of a flowchart I created, but again, not that great at PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so this is like, so when I originally come to, you know, our management, I was like, I want to work on trying to solve, you know, the retention problem, trying to predict churn. And part of what I do to try to sell them on why they should have me spend more time on this instead of, you know, helping customer pull whatever data they need is um, trying to show them how the process look like. Um, because, you know, when you go talk to these management, they're like, oh, machine learning, this new flashy topic, but most of them don't really know what I do or what a lot of us do. Um, I still have to expl explain to people what data scientists, like, why, why are you a data scientist? What does data scientists do? Um, so, um, so here's what I sort of showed them the whole process looked like. Um, at the beginning, we have all these raw data, and then um, I'll show you a quick chart of how our data infrastructure looked like. Um, there are raw data that describe what the customer is. Um, you know, things like where they're located, you know, is their logo blue, or um, do they allow people to bring dogs to work? Um, so these are all customer attributes. There's also usage pattern, and these are just a couple examples of the type of feature you will feed into a model. Um, you then split the data randomly. Um, for you who are familiar with machine learning, this is very basic stuff. Um, train your model, test the model on test data set. Um, once you have a model that's, you know, decent enough, you want to productionalize, you put the model into production, test on the new data, and then you output whether or not the customer is churn or no churn. So it seems very simple enough, um, but the project uh, took me three months to do. So, um, and before I start, here is um, just a little bit about our data infrastructure. It's very important, I think, um, when you're approaching a data science or a machine learning problem to understand what type of data is there available to you. And the data might not all, always be readily available already. So we view our data infra infrastructure as the foundation for the rest of our analyti analytics work. Um, and the main point I wanna get at is for a lot of company, one of the first challenge they have regarding data is the fact that data are all in different silos. Um, you have your production data, you know, that contain events from the customer, their logins, their usage pattern. Um, but then you have Salesforce data. And I don't know how many of you guys work in enterprise that use Salesforce, but Salesforce data base essentially contain a lot of customer, customer attribute. Um, what location they are, these are um, information that sort of salespeople fill out when they're in, engaging with the customer, how many employees they have, what product have they purchased. Um, and linking all these data to each other is not always simple. It's an ongoing challenge. Um, and here is just a quick view of some of the data source that we had to deal with. So top is sort of our internal, our own data store. Um, bottom, we have Salesforce. Um, we have iTunes, Google Play. So these are, um, we also have mobile apps that we develop. So linking users to those, like, you see in Apple, you see ID one, two, three, you don't know who they are. Um, and then you see in our data store, you're like, is user one, two, three is the same as user ABC? Uh, ABC. That's uh, one of our very um, first challenge essentially we try to tackle. Um, and then we have all other, a bunch of other <laughs> um, data sources that are just all in silos essentially. Um, so one of the first thing we try to do is um, put them together so they provide context. You know, they're meaningful data. Um, they link to each other. 
Um, so we go through the ETL uh, process. Uh, we use Amazon Redshift for our data warehouse. And then from the data warehouse, we output um, data for consumers to, or business users to consume. So we use Tableau as our internal data dashboard, basically. Um, and then there are um, other applications that we send data to. So business consumers don't have to write their own SQL query to get the data they need. So a little bit about the process. Um, when you first start, of course, the first thing you're doing is feature and exploratory analysis. I probably spent a couple weeks on this just figuring out what data we even have. Um, and then, of course, you know, very soon after, I realized we have these like data in Google Analytics that no one knows how to really access. So bring these in. Um, and you know, when I was doing my master at iSchool, um, a lot of the data are very clean. You know, when you get a project, it's like here is a data source. Everything's already very clean. You don't have to spend weeks cleaning out the data. Um, but that's not the case in real world. World, you're like, why are people misspelling words all the time? Um, <laughs> and like in, I think in Salesforce, there's one company that had like 50 different records because people just spelling their name in all kind of way. Like, does it have an ink in the end? Does it not have an ink in the end? So you're just cleaning the data for at the beginning and trying to figure out, you know, what features are even relevant. Um, a term model is really only as good as the features that are going into it. Um, so um, after cleaning out the data, I very soon reach another roadblock. Um, a lot of features I want to use um, are not there. Um, so then you go into feature engineering. Um, trans feature engineering is about transforming some of the existing data into feature that better represent the underlying um, model. So better feature means better results and maybe simpler model. Um, so I spend probably like a month or two try to feature engineer some of the feature that we want to use. So a lot of feature like um, usage data, you get a lot of you know, log data from, you know, different, from Splunk or from engineer, um, just on usage pattern that a customer have, how many logs in they have. But, you know, what does it mean when a customer say their user had a hundred log in last month? You want to transform that into something more meaningful. Um, so, for example, one of the things I did is I tried to normalize across customers. What does an average behavior look like? Um, are they overutilizing our product? Are they underutilizing product? You want to have a benchmark. And the raw data often do not give you that. Um, so that is um, what I didn't did. And uh, lastly, going to model selection. So um, I'm not here to talk about you know, all the complicated models. Um, I think when you're first approaching a product, often the simpler the better. And the, the issue with a lot of complicated models out there is that it's almost impossible to productionalize in real life. Um, so once I get that out of the way, um, we can talk about modeling. So the first thing you want to look at is you have all these models out there. You know, you go on Psychic Learn, there are dozens of models that you can just plug in and play. Um, but it gives you all different type of metrics. How do you tell what model is the best? So one of the first thing um, is accuracy. Uh, people often talk about how accurate your model is. But for um, this specific um, problem we're trying to tackle, accuracy is basically useless. Um, the, the main issue with enterprise churn is that there's not a lot of churn in enterprise. Um, if you ask if you have any friends who work in the SaaS um, business or if you work in the SaaS business, you, you will know that churn rate is usually less than 25%, and that's actually an overestimate. If you have 25%, you're actually not doing so well. Um, so if I just go in and predict that no one is churning, then I'm already at 75% accuracy. I, and I can be like, look at how great this is. I didn't even do any work. So, um, so accuracy is not the whole picture. Um, and so then you look at, you know, you want to look at precision and recall. So for those of you who are not super familiar with those, um, precision or recall is basically the percent of correctly identified churn out of all the churn that happens. So a very good model should have a very high uh, recall. Um, and precision, um, just want to focus on precision because that's actually the main problem we run into later on. So precision is the percentage of identified churn 
that actually end up churning. So the focus of our model, you know, we very quickly realized that we want to have a model um, that has very high recall and very decent precision. Um, so we want to optimize the identification of renewal that are likely to churn while minimizing the number of false positive. Um, so we then went into model selection. Um, so this is probably what you, sorry, if you search about machine learning, you'll see the most two common word, word supervised versus non-supervised. Um, in short term um, prediction, a lot of people will tell you it's a classification problem. And it, it is true, definitely, for most churn prediction out there, it is a classification problem because you're trying to classify whether or not an account churn or does not churn. Um, so there are also more sophisticated models out there that will break out your churn group into how likely are they going to churn. Are they low risk, medium risk, or high risk? Um, for most classification problem, we take a supervised approach. Um, so the first thing, um, and me being me want to start easy, is I just plug everything into a log logistic regression. And it's not because I think it will do very well, but logistic regression is always an easy sell to your engineer. It's very simple to understand. They can just do their research on Google. Um, it's very ex easy to explain to them what it does, and um, they don't have to do very complicated work to implement a model like this. And a lot of large company out there, um, you'll be surprised how many logistic regression are the actual machine learning model behind some of the, you know, for example, online advertising that you see, because um, there's so much data, you need to train your model very fast. So um, usually logistic regression is like the first thing people usually test out. But in our case, we don't have a lot of data point on um, being an enterprise um, company. We only have thousands of customers, hence why tens of thousands of data point. So then um, it did not give me very good um, results, which was expected. So then I went into other model. So um, the two that you'll see very commonly in use are naive face and random forest. Um, the most common thing you'll see people use naive face for is text classification. Um, both models in this case has their pros and cons in theory. Um, so for naive face, it performed well. Um, it performs well when there are multiple classes. And that was originally what my uh, approach was going to be is we're going to predict no churn and then low, median, high risk. Um, so I thought that could be a good, um, a good use for it, but, um, but it just turned out that the sample size I have is so small. Once I slice it into train data and test data, and usually test data is your 20% of your data set, the amount of um, individual class are just so small that um, we cannot really tr uh, train and test on those data set. Um, on the other hand, so we have random forest. Um, random forest is probably one of the best model out there um, that you'll read about for um, term prediction. Um, however, it has one um, sort of what I call weakness, um, is that it does not do very well with dynamic data. If you're just having raw data out there, um, maybe random forest would be like the perfect approach for it. But um, I quickly realized before I did like my homework to run through is that um, I engineer a bunch of features that are dynamic data. Um, they're essentially, um, for example, usage pattern of customer in the last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Um, and as you can see, as time progress, these metrics are going to change. Um, you know, how many customer logged in the last 30 day at the end of January is gonna be different from end of February. So, um, so after going through this, um, Random Forest actually gave me a decent model, but I thought, is there something better out there? And to look at something different, we then had to view this problem different. If it's not a classification problem, then what can we view um, term prediction as? And one of the things we thought about is maybe we can then treat it as anomaly detection problem. So anomaly detection is very um, common in security. Um, it's another topic. It's actually another project I worked on. Um, hence why we're like, we should maybe view this as anomaly detection because it happened so rarely. Um, if you have, let's say if you have 10 um, 
accounts that you're trying to renew this month at only two churn. Um, those are seen as anomalous occurrence. So, um, so we tried a couple models that we built for anomaly detection. So the two main ones are the multivariate Gaussian distribution and clustering, which is probably the most common unsupervised machine learning model out there. Um, Multivariant Gaussian distribution had, um, we realized there's a problem with that model very quickly because it expects if you have anomalies, it expects the anomalies to um, sort of behave, behave um, and look anomalous in the same way. So if you think about, you know, DOS attack or like people trying to hack in, a lot, often the behavior is similar for each incident. And that's not true with churn. Um, people can churn for any reason. Um, we don't want them to leave us, but you know, sometimes companies get acquired by other companies where they go out of business. And these are things we cannot predict. Um, so we thought about maybe using clustering. Um, so clustering is very good at detecting difference between different clusters. However, you can't really tell um, if the clusters are different because of churn or because of something else. It could, I mean, it could be because their logo colors are all different. Like here is a cluster of all company with blue logos and all company with orange logos. So, um, so uh, that didn't really give me many good results. And ultimately, one of the biggest challenge is that there's just not a lot of data. Um, so in the, oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so in the end, we look at you know confusion matrix for each model, sort of compare their precision and recall. Um, so random forest actually performed very, very well with very high recall over ninety percent, but we ended up with a sixty to seventy percent precision, and that was a really tough sell to our renewal team. They were like, "You cannot productionalize this." Um, so I'll just go into the challenge really quick about why that was such a big problem. Um, so one of the big first thing is um, class imbalance for our challenge. The data was so skewed that um, we couldn't use most of the model out there. Um, so limitation on data, uh, this is both in terms of quality and in terms of volume. So we only have, you know, a few thousand customers instead of millions of consumer, pro you know, customers out there. So predicting churn, especially for a customer who has very long contract, um, is almost you know, it's, it's, it's very limited. Um, sometimes you do not see a churn event or a potential churn event happen for a customer until three years or five years down the line. Um, and it's the same thing with uh, quality. Uh, often the data out there, um, what you're constantly dropping, adding new features. Um, you're not collecting this data across the board, across all your customers through a long period of time. Um, and then various reasons for churn, and then over classification uh, and live tests can be very costly. So this is ultimately why we could not productionalize our model, because if you think about it, if you have 10 customer, two ultimately will churn, but two end up not churning, but you still spend all your workforce on those accounts trying to make sure they don't churn, these are essentially costs that you end up wasting. And you know, you might think four accounts is not a lot to manage, but as you scale, and become, you know, you're trying to renew a thousand account every single month. And then you have workforce who are trying to micromanage these 200 accounts. It's just not scalable. So um, last slide, um, what will help? So more data is always going to be better. Um, the thing with machine learning is with more data over time, even if you have a very simple model, um, you can get away with it because there's just so much data. Um, your model should directly always improve with more data. Um, and the hope is that when you have so much data, like billions of records like Google does, um, you can definitely get away with a very simple like logistic regression. It'll probably perform as well as a more complicated model. Um, more relevant feature is always going to be good um, once that can identify. I mean, ideally, if I can know what company is going to be acquired in the future, I mean, there's a lot of other things I can do with it, but I can definitely um, predict term better if I know they're going to be acquired or go out of business. Um, and lastly, uh, data completeness. Um, there are just certain features that are you know, that are just now being constantly collected. Um, one of the major 
problem you'll run into in the real world is always about um, your data quality, um, how complete your data set is. So overall, um, prediction is very difficult. Um, at Okta, we actually develop metrics to measure the health of our customer, um, sort of as a result of these project, we end up now productionizing a live model, but we're able to use features that are good at in, in indicating certain type of churn, um, build that into a score. Um, it still requires human intervention um, to determine whether or not the, me uh, the metrics accurately represent whether customers are fully utilizing our products, but you know, it's definitely a work in progress, um, and I hope you learned something from our attempt at solving this problem. All right, thank you.